I think we'll begin. Uh, my name is Paul Wright. I'm the director of Citrus, and I wanted to welcome everybody. The company that you all know since you're in electronics called Infineon, once Siemens but now Infineon, sponsors these seminars and they pay for your wonderful lunches that you're eating. And I always make the little joke at the beginning, these are being webcast to the other three Citrus campuses, so your eating might be on the web, so be careful how you eat. You don't want to have a piece of mayonnaise running down your cheek. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we are still going ahead this year with our Big Ideas competition, which especially attracts the graduate students, where for $30,000, if you have brilliant ideas and you want to develop them around the ideas of sustainable technology and energy or in water and use IT for that, the proposals are due on March 30. Uh, 23rd, excuse me. So that leads me now to say that my colleague, uh, Professor Ming Wu in the front, and I are going to uh, work with Professor King as she introduces this new topic of beyond transistor scaling. Uh, Sujay is very, very prominent in the electronics community. Uh, she got her degree at Stanford and was a researcher at the Xerox uh, Park environment and has always been doing work in polycrystalline silicon thin film transistors. She's been on the faculty here for more than 10 years. She joined in August 1996. And not only is she a professor of electrical engineering, you may know that she uh, oversaw the uh, micro lab for many years. And now she's the associate dean for research in the College of Engineering, which I can tell you right now is a difficult job as we try and manage our budgets and provide seed funding for many of our research activities on campus. So uh, would you warmly welcome me with a round of applause for Professor King. Thank you, uh, Professor Wright. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Um, good afternoon, and thanks for coming. Uh, it's good to see some familiar faces. I um, actually presented, uh, prepared this presentation assuming that actually most of you are not, uh, don't have an EE background. Okay? So this is sort of a big picture kind of a um, seminar. So basically, my, my talk is, is uh, on the slide here. Basically, I'll be looking at um, helping you look at new devices beyond um, the ordinary transistor that has been the workhorse of the IC industry uh, for the last four decades or so as we look into the future for very efficient energy um, information processing. So um, just to start, um, <coughs> devices. So the integrated circuit technology, basically, uh, we, today we live in the information age. And advances in the integrated circuit technology over the last 40 years or so to continue to advance the transistor to scale it down in dimensions have, have led to improvements in performance, reductions in cost per function. And so the semiconductor market has grown steadily at an exponential pace over the years. Of course, this year is probably going to flatten out a little bit, but, but it will still be over 200, represent over $200 billion um, of, um, of the market. So basically, uh, as you can see, integrated circuit devices are used in all kinds of de um, devices that we um, use to, to communicate, to, to work, to play, and, and even to fight today. So um, that's basically where we are today. So I'd like to just take a, uh, maybe 15 minutes or so just to review you know, how did we get to the point where we are today, how, how has IC technology advanced, and then, and then explain why we are facing a new crisis in terms of energy efficiency um, as the transistors scale down to smaller and smaller dimensions. And then the, the meat of my talk really will be in describing some possible solutions to this power crisis, and that is new transistor or switching device designs. And I'll conclude with a summary. So brief history of the transistor. The reason why the transistor was invented was for improved energy efficiency. Okay. Um, many years ago, uh, decades ago, uh, a, a basic switching device was a vacuum tube. Looks kind of like a light bulb. Basically, in a vacuum tube, you have uh, several um, terminals. The current flowing through between two terminals was controlled by the voltage on a third terminal. That's just the basic uh, idea, concept of a switch. And actually, uh, vacuum tubes were used to um, make to, to perform complicated computations um, for various applications like radio, television, telephone equipment, and so on. And here's an example of the first digital computer that was built using vacuum tube technology. Um, in fact, actually, you can see an example of a vacuum tube computer at the um, Computer History Museum in Mountain View. Um, that's actually the first time I ever saw uh, a vacuum tube computer when I visited that museum. So these vacuum tubes worked just fine, uh, but they were expensive. 
and especially they were energy hungry. So if, as we wanted to build systems with more uh, complicated capabilities, um, this became a problem. And so uh, AT&T um, at, at Bell Laboratories, uh, that spawned the invention of some more energy efficient switch um, that could perform digital functions to turn on, on and off. So that led to the invention of the a transistor in 1947 for which Nobel Prize was awarded in physics. And here's just a picture I'm sure many of you have seen of the first transistor that was demonstrated. But this kind of a structure was difficult to reproduce in large quantities. And so actually a more improved version, the bipolar junction transistor that was used in decades af uh, later uh, was invented. And the benefit here in, in order to make it useful was that we can actually, people could actually fabricate BJTs, bipolar junction transistors, um, very, uh, with very uniform characteristics, and, and they, they, they operated reliably. And they were also che easier and cheaper to make at that time. So soon, soon afterwards, in the 50s, companies started to produce transistors in individual packages like this. They were a few dollars each. Um, and people were able to put these transistors on print circuit boards and insert them, uh, connect the, uh, interconnect the circuit boards to, um, to uh, implement computer, computers. But eventually, this turned out to be too expensive an approach as well. So that led to the invention of the integrated circuit, um, really just to reduce the cost of um, connecting of all, uh, a, a system with all these uh, transistors connected together. So an integrated circuit simply is a, a single substrate that um, has a lot of electronic components, primarily transistors, and they're interconnected together, um, and so they can be very compact. Here's a picture of the first integrated circuit that was actually um, made using germanium transistors. Germanium was a semiconductor material of choice in the early days. And so there are several, maybe six, four or six transistors, I forgot, BJTs on this slab of germanium, and they were interconnected actually off this, not the interconnects, wire interconnects were not actually on that slab. And so, so even though this was fairly small and compact, uh, soon afterwards, so that was at Texas Instruments, soon afterwards um, at Fairchild Semiconductor, um, researchers uh, found a way to also fabricate the metal interconnects that connect the resistors and transistors on this piece of silicon together to make the whole circuit very compact. So this is so compact that it doesn't make sense to even show it in a picture like that. So in, from those early, the, the first demonstrations of an integrated circuit uh, device, uh, we've, the industry has made steady progress to connect more and more devices uh, and fabricate more and more devices on a single substrate. And the benefit of doing that is that you can have more and more complex tasks um, performed by the integrated circuit. And so this is basically Moore's law, that the number of devices on a single chip, an integrated circuit chip, has increased steadily at an exponential pace with time, and this is uh, this still holds today in terms of number of devices on a chip increasing. Okay, and so today integrated circuits are made um, on wafers of silicon that are roughly 12 inches in diameter. Each wafer can hold hundreds or thousands of integrated circuit chips, such as a, a microprocessor as shown here. So the the, the fact that uh, so the benefit of integrated circuit technology is that we can actually f fabricate all of these. Uh, d dies at once. So you do a single process to the wafer, you, you're basically performing that to every single die. So basically you can fabricate hundreds or thousands of die at once and the cost per die is relatively low. All right, so let me review first then. On the, in, on the integrated circuit, um, nowadays there are more than a billion transistors on the most advanced integrated circuits. So I'd like to just review what is the switching device that is, dominated, uh, that is dominantly used in an integrated circuit today. And that is the MOSFET. So MOSFET <laughs> stands for metal, which is the metallic gate electrode. Oxide, which is the insulating layer that separates the gate from the semiconductor. So metal oxide semiconductor is a field effect transistor. So you apply a voltage to the gate to control the conductivity of the semiconductor underneath the gate to allow current to flow or not uh, between the source and drain electrodes. So the source and drain electrodes are formed in the semiconductor itself as well. These are uh, shaded different color because they are doped intentionally uh, with impurities. So they have impurities here that, um, that make these regions highly conductive. Only, only the channel region in the middle here underneath the gate is not usually conductive unless you apply a uh, high, sufficiently high voltage on the gate 
to form, to, to cause a uh, conductive layer to form at the surface here between the source and the drain. So if you look at the current flowing between the source and drain of the transistor and plot it as a function of the gauge voltage, okay, um, you will see that really no current flows until the gate voltage exceeds some threshold value. Okay, so that's called the threshold voltage, VTH. All right, so above, be, below the threshold voltage, there's not a um, significant number of uh, mobile charge in the channel to conduct current. Above the threshold voltage, there's significant amount of charge in the channel, so that current can flow between the source and drain. And that amount of charge, as you increase the gate voltage, um, the, the amount of charge, mobile charge in the channel increases, and that's why the current increases as you increase the gate voltage above the <coughs> threshold. Now, some critical device dimensions here that I'd like to highlight. Uh, the gate length, that is basically the, the, roughly the separation between the source and drain regions of the terminals of the transistor. The gate dielectric thickness, so this is, this is an insulate, electrically insulating layer, and it, uh, we usually call it the oxide thickness here. It's typically about close to one nanometer in the most advanced technologies today. And the junction depth um, here, the, of the, the depth of the um, heavily doped low resistance regions of the transistor, um, that's typically uh, less than the gate length in order to make sure that you don't have you know, subsurface leakage, some strange leakage pass occurring here out of the control of the gate. So we want the gate to control the current flowing be between the source and drain this way. Now the MOSFET, if you think of it simply as just a switch, um, you want, when the, when the gate voltage is higher than the threshold voltage, you want the transistor to conduct a lot of current. Okay, so the faster, the more current your transistor conducts, the more quickly your digital circuits can operate because uh, basically the way a digital circuit operates is that you, you transmit voltages. So you want to change a voltage from low to high, you have to charge up the capacitance on that um, node. And so the, higher, the larger the current you have, the faster that node capacitance can charge up. So high on, on current is desired for fast circuit operating speed. Low off-state current is required just not to, not to waste power. Okay, primarily. All right, so here's a uh, transmission electron micrograph of a r relatively state-of-the-art transistor. Um, you see the gate electrode here. Here's the semiconductor um, channel here. Uh, and then the source and drain regions, these darker regions on the left and right. So current uh, flows between the source and drain under the control of the voltage on the gate. And you cannot see the gate dielectric very easily because it's only about a nanometer thick, okay, a few atomic layers thick. Now, I just want to mention here that you know, the term that we use in this, in this field is CMOS, and that just means that um, it's just referring to complementary MOS devices. So these regions of semiconductor material can be doped either to have a lot of positively charged uh, mobile carriers to conduct current, in which case they would be P-channel devices, or these two regions here could be doped such that they have a lot of negatively charged carriers. So that would be n-channel device in the case of an n-channel device. So you have a lot of electrons in the source and drain regions for an n-channel device. Um, the positively charged devices we call, uh, uh, particles we call holes in a semiconductor jargon. Okay? So the difference between n-channel and p-channel devices is, is this. Basically, in order to turn on an n-channel device, you have to make the gate voltage larger than the source vol voltage to accumulate electrons to form an electron um, channel in the uh, electron layer in the channel to allow current to flow between the um, electron-rich source and the electron-rich drain. Now, for a p-channel device, you want the gate voltage actually to be negative, okay, lower than the source voltage. Okay, so then the positively charged holes will be attracted to this negatively, relatively negative gate. So then you can form a layer of positive mobile charge here to turn on the p-channel device. Okay, so. If you look at CMOS devices and circuits, this is just a simple example. Um, here are the simple uh, circuit uh, symbols for N-channel and P-channel MOSFET. P-channel, the only difference is that you have this little circle there on the elect to demarcate the uh, gate. So, so this is a PMOS device. You can tell just by that little circle there. So the gate controls the current flowing between the source and drain electrodes. So how do we make digital circuits? We just connect them like this in complementary pairs. Um, so you, you can actually apply voltage to the gate of the n-channel transistor. When the gate voltage, when this voltage is high, when the input voltage is high, this transistor will turn on because the source is grounded. So this gate to source voltage to turn on this transistor. That will connect the output node to ground. So the output node, so the output voltage will go low to zero 
when the input Vn is high. Conversely, if the input is zero right here, um, you will have a large negative voltage. Well, the gate voltage will be much lower than the source voltage of the PMOS transistor, which is biased at the power supply voltage. And so the PMOS transistor will turn on when the input is low and make sure that V out is connected to the power supply voltage. So V out is high when input is low. So this is a simple CMOS inverter circuit. But you can see that at any, when no, nothing is happening, uh, when input is either low or high, basically only one of those transistors is on. In other words, they operate in a complementary fashion. And that's a, um, sort of a logic gate symbol. So we can actually implement um, logic functions and uh, memory with, these, with the simple inverter. So let me give you an example. So let's say we have an inverter uh, connected to another inverter like this. So you can have low voltage on one side and high voltage on the other or you can somehow force the voltage on one side to change and that will cause the voltage on the other side to switch as well. And we can connect the two storage nodes here to the outside world to, to be read so we can see if it's, we can either write or read a high or low voltage um, stored on, uh, in, the, in the cell like this. So we use transistors which we turn on with a word line voltage to access the information to either read or write that information stored in the memory cell. That's very simple. So CMOS technology today, well, the reason why CMOS came on the, onto the scene is because normally when, you're, when, the, when the input is low or the input is high, um, you, one of these transistors is off. So you have no leakage current flowing between the power supply and ground. There's no direct path, current path, between power supply and ground. And so the static power dissipation of CMOS was reduced. Okay, so the whole theme here is energy efficiency. We, want to, we don't want to waste energy. So that's why CMOS technology is really used for the highest density integrated circuits today because they dissipate the least amount of energy. They don't waste energy. The only energy is used when you, nominally, when you switch the state of the um, circuit. Okay? So over the last four decades or so, we've scaled steadily, the, indus the industry has scaled steadily the size of the transistor. So here's just a simple cross-sectional view of a MOSFET, the gate controlling the current flowing between the source and drain. And all we do is, from one generation of technology to the next, we scale down the lateral and vertical dimensions proportionately, so the transistor looks similar. And so as we scale down the size of the transistor, we can reduce the capacitance okay, of, the, of, the, of the nodes here, so the output Voltage, if you recall, is connected to the drain of the transistor. So this junction capacitance here, um, the size of the gate, um, that, that all gets scaled down. So capacitance goes down, um, and if you scale down the size of the transistor, you can scale down the voltage, ideally, a little bit too. Um, so the total amount of charge you need to transfer to get this, the, the digital circuit to operate gets reduced. Now, as you scale down the size of the transistor, you also reduce the current but that's okay because reduction in the required charge goes down. So you, bottom line is you get better performance. This digital circuit can switch faster um, because you're char you don't need as much charge transfer to perform a digital function. Also, since the transistors are smaller, you can fit more of them, uh, more chips onto a single wafer, and so the cost per chip goes down. And so because of this, you, get, you can enable uh, designers to develop more useful uh, gadgets, I guess, um, and uh, people will buy them if they're affordable. And that, that, so the industry makes a profit and they reinvest it to advance the technology further. Oops. And this cycle has gone on for about four decades, more, more than four decades. And it's so consistent or historically has been so steady, the p progress, that the industry has created this technology roadmap for semiconductors just so that they can anticipate, companies can anticipate, okay, by let's say by the year 2010, okay, we sh the, the equipment those equipment manufacturers have to be able to produce equipment or tools that are capable of defining features at you know, this particular size. So you might have heard of, um, from Intel or IBM when they, when they brag about their 90 nanometer, 65 nanometer, 45 nanometer generation of technology, what they're referring to is the smallest half pitch so, uh, on, on their chip. In, okay, so in a manufacturing process, there's a, some limitation as to how tightly, uh, how dense your features can be packed together, how densely your features can be packed together. So this pitch here, let's say you have lines and spaces that you want to define in your integrated circuit, the minimum spacing and the, uh, the minimum pitch, you take half of that, and that defines your technology node. So the most advanced technology in manufacturing today is um, from Intel, 45 nanometer generation of technology in production. It's going to take uh, maybe another year for many companies to catch up to Intel so that it's in high volume, so that 45 nanometer technology is in really in high volume 
manufacturing. So if you look at this, what the industry has done, they've steadily scaled down the dimension of the transistor, that gate length that I pointed out, bringing the source and drain, uh, the electrodes closer together. And you can see within the next 10 years or so, easily, uh, it's projected that the transistors will be on the order of 10 nanometers in dimension. So I just wanted to give you an, an, um, a sense of how small 10 nanometers is. This is a log scale showing the diameter, let's say, of a human hair. Actually, this is a very coarse human hair if it's 100 ma microns. But just looking at uh, biomole biomolecules, um, DNA, um, you can see that the size of the transistor, 35 nanometers here today, in the next decade or so, is going to be definitely um, smaller than, um, let's say, even like pro protein molecules. So these are really small, small devices. And advancements in integrated circuit processing technology have made it possible to actually make sensors and detectors um, that can detect these biomolecules simply because we now can make uh, sensors that are sort of on the same scale as these, these um, molecules that we'd like to detect. Okay, so let me come, so that's a quick background on uh, MOSFETs and MOSFET scaling. So now, why are we facing a new energy crisis with re respect to electronics? Okay, so the key point here is that the MOSFET is not a perfect switch. It has leakage current in the off state. So remember I showed you this plot um, showing how the MOSFET current increases with the gate voltage, and uh, ideally below the threshold voltage, there's no, no current flowing. Now, if we zoom in and look at it on a log scale, okay, if we look at the current on a logarithmic scale, we see that this is not the case. Certainly, um, above the threshold voltage, um, the current increases linearly, so that's why it sort of round, rolls off like this on a log scale. But below the threshold voltage, the current actually doesn't shut off immediately. It, it gradually decreases at a logarithmic pace, and so that if you have zero volts on the gate relative to the source electrode, um, you still will have some leakage current flowing. Okay, so that's the off-state current, I off. Um, I'd like to just introduce this, um, uh, this uh, parameter here. This slope, okay, the steepness at which you can turn off the transistor, um, is a sort of a, a measure of how well designed the transistor is. Um, and that s slope is uh, called, referred to as the subthreshold swing, or S for short. And subthreshold swing has interesting units. It's millivolts per decade. So in other words, if you want to reduce the current by one decade, okay, below the threshold voltage, how many millivolts do you need to reduce the gate voltage by? Okay, so typical subthreshold swing voltage uh, values today are about 100 mi millivolts per decade. So in other words, if you want to reduce the, the current by one order of magnitude, you have to reduce the gate voltage below the threshold voltage by a tenth of a volt, okay? All right, so that's, that's the typical value. And so let's say your, your circuit designer says, oh, I cannot tolerate a certain amount of leakage. Okay, your transistor has to have no higher than this amount of leakage. Well, that basically tells you then, given that you know what the subthreshold swing is for your transistor design, and that's going to dictate what your threshold voltage is going to be. Okay? And this, this is basically a, a fundamental design trade-off, because ideally you'd like to have a low threshold voltage for your transistor, so that when you apply a gate to source voltage that's limited by the power supply voltage. If you apply the maximum possible gate to source voltage, which is equal to the power supply voltage, you want to have the, f the largest current flowing in your transistor so that your circuit operates as quickly as possible. So the on-state current of your transistor increases um, if the threshold voltage goes down. Okay? Um, so the VDD here defined is the power supply voltage. So let's say you have a device with a low threshold voltage. In other words, here's the threshold voltage. See, it's close to zero. You, get, you can have good on-state current, but the off-state current is basically very high. And so you might only get two orders of magnitude difference between on and off states. And for most circuit applications, that's not acceptable. Um, so generally then, the industry has not aggressively reduced the threshold voltage as we advance the technology, at least in recent generations of technology. So we keep the threshold voltage high about here so that the off-state leakage current can be reasonably low, okay? But the trade-off here then is that for the same value of VDD, um, if you want a low value of VDD, you end up giving up I, uh, the on-state current. In other words, you give up performance. So that's a fundamental design trade-off for the MOSFET technology. So if you look historically at how voltages have scaled, operating voltage has scaled with transistor dimensions, um, in, in, well, let's say in the, a few, uh, more than a decade ago, as we scaled down the size of the transistor, the power supply voltage came down pretty much uh, proportionately 
to the, uh, with, with the dimensions of the transistor. But bec and in, in order to um, make sure that the v, okay, VDD, the power supply voltage minus threshold voltage, we don't want to drastically reduce that because that slows down your, your circuit. So this, this gate overdrive, how much, the gate, how much gate voltage can you apply above the threshold voltage? This has come down a little bit, but we don't want it to go to zero. So basically, um, because threshold voltage cannot be scaled to zero, threshold voltage has been scaled down a little bit, but it cannot go anywhere close to zero. It's, it's sort of uh, slowed down and stopped at about 0.3 volts. Okay? Um, because, of, because we want some reasonable drive current for reasonable circuit speed, we haven't reduced the power supply voltage as aggressively. Okay, so, so that has led to this power issue that CMOS technology has, has been facing recently. So as we scale down the gate length of the transistor, okay, going below, well below a tenth of a micron, um, we scale down the threshold voltage gently, but that leads to exponential increases in the leakage. Remember, so if you shift the uh, IV curve down uh, because of the exponential dependence of uh, subthreshold current, um, or yes, exponential behavior, as you decrease the threshold voltage, you increase exponentially the leakage current in the off state. So this is what has happened over time as we advance a generation, uh, from one generation of technology to the next. And also because we are not scaling down the power supply voltage directly proportionately with the transistor dimensions, we, we pack more transistors in a single uh, square centimeter, but the energy required to operate those transistors is not scaling you know, in proportion to the, an to the area, so the active, even the energy or the power needed to operate your device has gone up, not only just the leakage power that you're wasting. Okay? And so for that reason, I'm sure some of you have seen you know, this trend, a historical trend looking at the power density, how many watts are being um, dissipated on your microprocessor chip as a function of the, uh, I guess, year, basically looking at different products that have been introduced. <laughs> so these products are more and more advanced technology, more and more transistors packed in uh, high density. And you can see that uh, in recent years, this decade, power density has exceeded or has, has approached 100 watts per centimeter squared, which is um, well above the, the power density that you would have on your stove top. Um, and it's, it's approaching that, I guess, of nuclear reactor. And you know, if you extrapolate this, it's not a good, um, not very good. You might need a nuclear reactor. <laughs> so basically, practically, we've stopped here, um, limited by the rate at which we can remove heat from the chip. Okay, so that's the trajectory that the industry was on, and you know, for a few years ago, people were worried about chips, you know, burning up hot chips, um, like this. All right, so what can we? What has been done to address this problem? Well, uh, let me explain. Well, first of all, we want to to solve this problem. We want to minimize the amount of energy it takes to perform an operation. That way, we can lower the power dissipation. Okay, so we know that we can lower the energy. Um, okay, the amount of energy needed to switch. Um, to, to perform a logic function is going to be proportional to the power supply voltage squared. Okay? And that's because the energy on a capacitor, um, depending on the voltage on the capacitor, is proportional to the voltage squared. Okay? So the energy that you need to spend to perform the, some useful operation is proportional to the power supply voltage squared. So all we have to do is scale down VDD to lower the energy. So that's basically what is shown here with the dotted line. As you scale down power supply voltage, the energy, the dynamic, the energy used for dynamic computation um, goes down quadratically. Okay. Now, what happens though is that um, the delay, the time it takes for you to perform that operation, uh, increases because you have less current flowing if you have if you're lowering the power <coughs> supply voltage, right? Because VDD minus VT, gate overdrive, is decreasing as you in decrease VDD. So if the delay is actually increasing because you're lowering the drive current, then this term here, the leakage, the amount of power, the, you spend more time leaking okay, to perform the function. So the leakage current, uh, sorry, the leakage energy, which is proportional to the delay, starts to increase. All right, so beyond a certain point, it makes no sense anymore to decrease the power supply voltage to save, to, to lower the energy per operation. So at that, um, sorry. Yes. Question? Um, so this could be, uh, I guess, joules per, well, at, at joules or, or femtojoules per operation. Yeah. 
So this is just you know, qualitatively to illustrate the point. So uh, CMOS circuit designers have done um, a lot of good research to try to minimize the energy required for CMOS circuits to operate. And they find that the, op the lowest reasonable uh, power supply voltage is maybe about a quarter volt. Beyond that, it doesn't make any sense to lower the power supply voltage any further to save energy. So if we look at this, this a little bit differently, looking at, the, again, the energy per operation, it's just normalized, sorry, energy per operation versus the delay, which is essentially one over the throughput. Okay? Um, if you want to lower the energy per operation, then you will have to give up in uh, throughput, so, so the delay will be longer. But beyond a certain point, as you, so basically what you're doing here is you're lowering the power supply voltage. So beyond a certain point, it doesn't make any more sense to lower the supply voltage anymore because you're not really gaining anything in energy efficiency, but you're just slowing down your circuit. Okay? So CMOS has this fundamental lower li limit in energy per operation, and that, that the fundamental cause is subthreshold leakage. And so what the industry has done then, you know, they haven't followed this extra you know, extrapolated trajectory. They've actually leveled off in terms of power density by, going to, uh, by using parallelism. Okay, so like dual core or quad core processors. Basically what you do, this allows you to do is you can operate each core um, at a lower energy point. So you give up performance, okay, you operate each core at a, a slower clock rate, let's say, than you normally might want to. And so that, that allows you to save energy. Then you can run multiple cores in parallel. So exploit parallelism to, to improve the throughput of your system. That way you can get high throughput at low energy per operation. Okay, compared to if you had just done the same thing as before, scaling, um, you would have to, for the same throughput, you'd have to spend a lot more energy. Okay? So th this is what has led to the, the need to go to parallelism. Good, good for us to do research, right? Okay, but eventually, if we do this, let's say today, we can, yes, we can actually slow down our circuits purposely and, and use, exploit parallelism to rec recover the, uh, the performance. But eventually, we're, not, we're going to run out of um, space here because we're already going to be operating near the minimum energy point. It doesn't, we don't have any performance to, uh, to give up in, uh, because we won't get any, well, we won't achieve any more ben energy efficiency benefit if we give up any more performance. So in the future, you can only take this parallelism uh, to a certain extent. In the future, once you hit that minimum energy limit of CMOS, you will not be able to improve um, performance and lower energy per operation. Okay? So that's why we need a new switch, something that will replace the MOSFET. Okay, so this is pretty quick. Um, breaking the thermal limit. So let me explain now in a little bit of detail uh, why we have this subthreshold swing here. Okay? So below the threshold voltage, basically the transistor, oh, let's, let's look at this, what, what happens. I'm drawing an energy band diagram here. This illustrates, um, okay, so in a, in a semiconductor solid material, um, there, the electrons can only uh, occupy um, energy levels within a certain band uh, range, okay, a range of energies. So this line here represents the lower limit, sort of the edge of the band of energies. So there are a lot of allowed energy states up here, okay? A lot of lo allowed energy states for energy, uh, electrons to occupy here. These circles represent electrons. Now, the thing, interesting thing is that electrons do have some distribution in energy due to thermal vibration, right? At room temperature, the lattice is vibrating, so electrons have some distribution of energy. The thing is that the energy, oops, sorry, the energy, uh, well, the density of electrons, the amount of, the number of electrons available um, actually, or, or occupying this allowed energy states within this band of allowed energies, it actually decreases exponentially as you go higher up in energy, okay? So what, what the transistor does, as you, as you change the gate voltage, what you're doing is you're sort of modulating this potential barrier, okay? So below the threshold voltage, there's a potential barrier that prevents electrons from flowing into the channel. And as you increase the gate voltage, you are lowering that barrier, so you are allowing exponentially more electrons to have enough, which have enough energy to go into the channel, okay? So that's why the drain current is exponentially dependent, dependent on the gate voltage, because the gate voltage modulates this potential barrier height. It's, since the gate is not directly connected to the channel, there's some efficiency factor here, n, okay? So if the gate were somehow directly connected to the channel, then this n would equal 1. 
But in any case, the best possible scenario is for n to be equal to 1. That means the gate has perfect, that this channel potential is directly changing with the gate voltage. And in that best case, the steepest this, this subthreshold swing can be is 60 millivolts per decade at room temperature. Okay? So that's going to dictate your I off and your I on for a given VDD. Now, if you want to lower the power supply voltage to overcome this uh, power density issue, then you really need to have some device that switches on, and, and you still want to get the performance, the required I on to get some performance level, and I off to minimize the to, to optimize the energy efficiency. Really want to come up with some device that switches on more steeply than a transistor. Okay? So the point is that you want to get some uh, desired I on and I off ratio, but with a smaller voltage swing. Okay? So you can uh, change the gate voltage just a small amount and get a large change in I on. Um, so I'll give you two examples very quickly here. So tunneling FET. Um, now, remember I mentioned in a, sem a semiconductor you have bands of allowed energy. So what I showed in the previous slide was this conduction band. So there are all these allowed energy states up here in this band. Now, in this transistor design, the main thing is that the source and the drain are not doped the same way. The source is doped heavily p-type, so it has a lot of positive charge. It doesn't have a lot of mobile electrons, except in the, uh, they're, they're bounded in the valence um, uh, covalent bonds. So the difference here with the, between a tunnel FET and a normal transistor is that the source and the drain are not doped the same type, the same polarity. So if you look at the energy band diagram, now in the source, you don't have a lot of electrons in this uh, conduction band. You have a lot of electrons in the valence band and a lot of available states in the conduction band as before. Okay. Now when you increase the gate voltage, again you lower, you lower the, the, the energy band diagram or the, this potential here in the channel. But that doesn't lower a barrier to electrons diffusing into the channel. It actually allows these uh, allowed energy states in the conduction band to sort of line up energetically with these uh, energy states in the valence band here and the source. So basically what you're doing is not changing the height of a barrier. You're just, allow you're just aligning states to allow tunneling to occur or not. So once the, this, this edge of the conduction band, which has all these allowed energy states here, moves lower than the edge of the valence band, which has all these electrons, you can have electrons, assuming that the barrier between these two regions is small, you can have electrons directly tunneling from the source into the channel. So then current can suddenly flow in this device. Okay? So the current is exponentially dependent on the electric field, which is this psi here. And that electric field is highly dependent on the thickness of your gate oxide that I pointed out earlier. Also, um, these parameters here, B especially, because the current is exponentially dependent on B, um, you can see that there's a dependence on the band gap okay, and the tunneling effective mass. So basically, the lighter the, the electrons are when they tunnel, the faster, the more current. The faster they can tunnel through and the more current that flows in your device. That's the effective mass. So you want that to be low. Uh, the band gap is this separation between these allowed states here and these allowed states here. We want that to be s small, so that allows for more overlap between for a given gate voltage between the valence band and the states and the conduction band states. So basically, um, it's exponentially dependent on the band gap of the material, the, the on current. So for silicon, if you want to use, make, make this kind of a tunneling device in silicon, yes, we can actually see, these are actually measured data, current on a log scale versus gate voltage. If you look at the low current region, um, yes, the subthreshold swing is better than 60 millivolts per decade. It's close to 50 millivolts per decade. However, when you go to high gate voltages, there's not much current. It's less current than a MOSFET would conduct. So that is a fundamental challenge that we're trying to address here at, at Berkeley. And clearly, looking at these equations, we can address that challenge by looking at alternative materials with smaller band gap to allow for higher on-state current and smaller effective mass to allow for higher tunneling um, current as well. But just taking those silicon TFETs, just taking their IV characteristics, comparing that to a MOSFET, how does the energy uh, efficiency compare? So, as, okay, so this plot is flipped around from before, I apologize. This is energy as a function of, perform, of performance. So now, uh, so this is decreased delay, uh, sorry, decreased delay to the right. Okay, so it's just sort of flipped from the previous slide. But basically, again, for CMOS, if you want to save energy, you have to give up performance. You have to go, let's say, below a gigahertz. Uh, clock frequencies. So how does a TFET technology compare with CMOS? Well, if you don't care about high performance, 
um, so that you don't need high I on and I off, because TFET cannot achieve high I on um, at reasonable voltage. Then a TFET can save, let's say, an order of magnitude um, of energy, uh, improve the energy efficiency by an order of magnitude or so compared to CMOS. But if you want to really achieve high uh, performance, then you either have to use parallelism to shift the TFET curve over, um, or, you, or CMOS is just going to be better, simply if, because um, if you want to get high performance, you can, you can achieve high ion with lower voltage with a MOSFET compared to the TFET. Okay, so TFETs with, made in silicon um, look uh, promising for improving energy efficiency if you don't want to go above a gigahertz kind of operation. All right, so at, at Berkeley, then, what are we doing? We're actually working on advanced materials to lower the effective band gap to get higher current. And actually, we do have some very good results here, but um, already achieved, but we can't, I can't pre present them because they haven't been published yet. Um, another issue here, for a challenge is, OK, well, it's good to get high ion, eye off, but we better be able to control the threshold voltage of the device. If we cannot control the threshold voltage, then you know, the on current and off current can vary over a wide range. So that's a fundamental challenge that we're trying to address now. And also, TFET, since it is not symmetric, um, you cannot use it uh, directly uh, to replace a MOSFET. There's some circuit design, uh, circuits that need to be redesigned to uh, accommodate these not asymmetrical uh, switching devices. So that's research that's ongoing here and at other schools. So finally, then another example is, well, you know, why don't we just go all the way? Go back to a mechanical switch. Mechanical switch, when you break contact, you've got zero leakage current. All right, and, and mechanical switches were used um, in the early part of this, uh, 19th, the 1900s. Um, and here's a, another example of a mechanical computer. It's on display at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. It's really big, um, not energy efficient, but anyway, just to show you that it can be done. And you can actually buy toys um, from the 1960s that do mechanical computation. So you know, Berkeley is a, a pioneer in MEMS technology. Um, the, the processing technology that has been developed for IC devices over the last four decades actually can be used to make mechanical devices. I'll just give you a quick view here. So you start with a silicon wafer, a cross-sectional view. You can deposit a sacrificial material, thin film, maybe a micron or less, pattern holes in it, then deposit your mechanical material. And notice wherever the mechanical material is, uh, uh, well, the mechanical material gets anchored to your substrate wherever you remove the sacrificial layer. And you can pattern that layer. And the only extra step, well, well, simply, <laughs> the one extra step you need to make a MEMS device is a release step where you remove selectively that sacrificial material. So now you, ha you can have a, a membrane that can de def deflect vertically in this direction. And so basically, um, this has been uh, developed. This kind of micro-machining technology has been developed at Berkeley. And the, probably the most prominent, well, most obvious uh, the MEMS device that we see today is a digital mirror um, device uh, developed by Texas Instruments, where you actually have a display. Each pixel, each picture element, basically is controlled by a micro mirror, either to deflect light or not into the um, projection lens. All right, so that's show, just showing that it's in production. So it's reliable, right? Um, I don't think anybody's ever had problems with a DMD <laughs> projector. So basically, what uh, my group here at Berkeley is now looking at is making a relay. Except, except now, since we can make the relays very small, maybe they can actually can be more energy efficient than a MOSFET. And it turns, out, it turns out that that is the case, because in the off state, you can actually have a, an air gap between the source and the drain. All right, so no, zero current flows in the, uh, in the off state. And we actually verified that uh, measuring the current versus the gate voltage. Really, this is just in the noise. So there's no leakage that flows when the gate voltage is below some threshold. Once you increase the gate voltage above some threshold, then the electrostatic force between that gate electrode and the body will cause that movable, this uh, movable stack here, to come down so that it will bring a metallic channel layer into contact with the source and drain to allow current to flow between the source and drain. So you can see here in this measured uh, current versus voltage, gate voltage characteristic, that the turn on is very abrupt. It's like zero uh, millivolts per decade. Okay? And here's the top view of the uh, relay that, that was uh, shown in cross cross-section here. So you have a gate here that's anchored to the substrate, and you have a channel attached to it that can move in and out of the plane of the wafer to, con to make contact between the source and drain electrodes. So because of time, I'll just uh, skim through this. But basically, as you scale down the size of the, of, the, of the relay, so change the width from 5 microns to 2 to 1, you reduce the operating voltage. 
And so we take this experimental data and extrapolate it. We find that if we scale down a relay to comparable dimensions of 90 nanometer generation MOSFETs today, the operating voltage should be on the order of 0.2 volts. So if you can reduce the VDD from 1 volt to 0.2 volts, then you can save the active power by uh, a factor of 5 squared, 25 times less power. Now, the only problem is that a mechanical switch takes longer to turn on, okay, 10 nanoseconds versus p less than a picosecond for a transistor. So we have been collaborating with circuit designers here at Berkeley to figure out, okay, well, how would you design a digital circuit using mechanical switches rather than electrical switches? And it turns out that you would design it completely differently than CMOS. You would ne the, the worst thing to do is to take to replace every single MOSFET in your circuit with a relay, because then your circuit would be really low, uh, slow. So it turns out that um, the time it takes to charge up and discharge uh, capacitances, to, to charge up and discharge nodes in your digital circuit, is negligible compared, compared to the time it takes to move your gate up or down. So basically, when you implement, let's say, an adder uh, circuit with relays, you would, you would actually design it so that all the relays move at once, so that within one mechanical delay, you have your result. So your throughput would be limited only by one mechanical delay. So this was published last year in a, um, in a conference. But bottom line is, if we look at energy versus delay, you know, for CMOS, again, if we want to reduce the energy, we have to increase delay, and there's some fundamental limit. With relays, we can actually go well below that energy efficiency limit, I mean, beyond that energy efficiency limit. And depending on how low of a voltage you want to operate the relay at and how much performance you want to trade off. Now, keep in mind that you can actually shift this curve over to the left, again, by adopting parallelism. So this plot here just shows for an, a, an example of an adder circuit, a 32-bit adder. Same layout area required for CMOS versus relay. Relays provide um, compellingly less, um, a more energy efficiency. So finally, then, what are the research topics? Well, I didn't mention, I showed you how the relay turned on. I didn't show you how it turned off. Turns out that the turn-off voltage can be different than the turn-on voltage. And so this hysteresis is due to sticking or stur surface adhesion forces. So basically, challenges here are how do we uh, control or minimize surface adhesion force to minimize this hysteresis? So that way, we can, uh, if we minimize that, we can scale the operating voltage down to reduce um, the power consumption. Um, also, the contact resistance, how does that scale with the size of the, tr of the relay. We don't want the resistance to go through the roof when we scale down the size of the relays, right? because then that will start to slow down the circuit. Um, so there's a trade-off. We can get lower contact, mechanical contact resistance if we, if we increase the force. But if we in increase the force, we might degrade the reliability of the device. So there's a lot of fundamental issues here. This is a really good area for research. And of course, there's a lot of work to be done, yet to be done, to design all the basic building blocks you need um, to implement, let's say, a microprocessor with relays. I want to point out here that MEMS is already being used, pursued by companies here, to enable very low power operation of, let's say, radios. So you, in the future, we might see, we expect to see radios on a chip. Like, you can implement a radio on a chip because the remaining things that need to be integrated on a chip are the filters and the timing reference. And Professor Nguyen here at Berkeley has, been, has a company where they're you know, developing MEMS filters that are smaller and lower power better quality factor uh, that you can actually fabricate directly on top of integrated circuits. And also another spinoff um, from Berkeley is looking at um, implementing timing references with MEMS. So basically all of the, this timing reference and all these RF filters in the future could be integrated uh, using low temperature processed MEMS on this chip. And that will help to enable the citrus vision of uh, low cost, low power, wirelessly networked sensors. And these sensor webs then, let's, let me point out here then, can really ish, uh, usher in the age of ubiquitous computing. We've already entered the age of ubiquitous computing in that you know, there's an average of more than one computing device per person today. Now, this cycle that I introduced at the beginning of the talk eventually will have to be replaced because scale, transistor scaling is not working like it has in the past. To increase in energy efficiency and the lower cost, we will need to have new devices and better circuit designs to use them. And so information technology in the future, if we can achieve lower um, power and lower cost per function, uh, such as by using MEMS for computation or for um, sensing and, and so on, uh, we will be able to make it more pervasive, embedded, 
and human-centered. So here's oh, some old examples. Sorry for those of you who've seen my talk before. So this guy is uh, up in the morning shaving, and he has all kinds of specialized information on his mirror. And of course, there are people developing clothes with sensors embedded. But here at Citrus, as you know, we're looking at societal scale systems, these uh, sensor nets, to really help address some of the big issues, so societal scale issues, such as energy. So uh, I know some of you have already seen Professor Spanos give a talk, but you know, most of the energy used today uh, in modern society is used in buildings. If we can monitor um, the usage and the need for energy usage in buildings, we can actually conserve quite a bit. So improving uh, the energy efficiency of the um, of the switches, of the integrated circuit devices, will enable us to actually deploy these sensor networks um, to improve energy efficiency overall in built environments. And of course, these sensor networks can be used to monitor and direct traffic for better efficiency, um, monitor um, pe personal care, and to detect threats in the environment, and to uh, detect, uh, I guess, structural damage and deploy emergency services where they're needed. So basically, um, with these more eff energy efficient devices, we can really help to realize this vision of Citrus that we can use information technology to improve the quality of life for all of us. Um, and I guess that's it. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <clears throat> so if anyone has any questions. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, I have a oh, okay. So, so can you comment on uh, uh, alternative materials uh, beyond uh, silicon? Uh, many people are looking at graphene and uh, other exotic materials. You ah, see. Uh, okay. So that's an excellent question. So, uh, a lot of people have been looking at alternative channel materials for the MOSFET. But if you're looking at improving energy efficiency, that's really not going to do much because with CMOS, the way we save, we achieve the highest energy efficiency is to operate the transistors in the subthreshold regime. Okay, so for a highest, for the best energy efficiency, you have to operate transistors in a subthreshold regime, and fundamentally, that 60 millivolts per decade limit exists no matter if it's a silicon or germanium or gallium arsenide. It doesn't matter. Okay, so the advanced channel materials are only good if you want to get high performance and you don't care about energy efficiency. Now, conversely, if for a tunnel fit, if you can, it, it does make sense to have uh, um, advanced channel uh, semiconductor materials which can give you higher tunneling current. So a smaller band gap or higher tunneling effective mass, those do make sense. So I think advanced channel materials will actually have much more benefit, well actually advanced source materials will have much more benefit for advanced switches like the tunnel fit compared to uh, conventional MOSFET. Because the problem today is not getting enough performance, it, it's actually reducing the power density. Do you have any other questions over here? How about the memris uh, memris memristor? Okay, so um, okay, so for non-volatile memory, um, actually, uh, actually, MEMS devices. We've done. A, I didn't because of limited time. I didn't show the table, um, but MEMS devices. If you have a mechanical beam that's programmed to, you know, snap, um, snap down or up, <laughs> kind of like you know when you buy soda from McDonald's. You know, they 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 have those little punch things in the lid to indicate it's diet or root beer. So that's a mechanical memory, right? So mechanical memory device, if they're scaled to, let's say, 100 nanometer type of uh, range of dimensions, it actually takes less energy to program and erase a mechanical beam um, to be up or down compared to conventional flash memory compared to memristor type devices. So um, again, energy is, um, the, especially for, for um, low cost flash memory, you really want to have high density of storage. And so the energy required to, you know, to program a memristor, you have to flow a lot of current, uh, maybe over a small voltage, but you know, the energy is actually significant. Oh, it's still orders of magnitude higher than for mechanical beam uh, scale to the comparable dimensions. So I think me mechanical uh, devices actually would, might, might find first application in, in non-volatile memory. Because the non-volatile memory, um, you know, the voltages used in state-of-the-art technology today are pretty high, like 10 volts. So you can get a beam easily to operate less uh, at a volt or so. So you can lower the voltage, lower the energy. And also, uh, for non-volatile memory, you don't need to program and erase, you know, uh, a trillion times. For, for, for logic, for microprocessor, you have to make sure each switch operates reliably over, you know, 10 to the 14th cycles. But for non-volatile memory, how, many, how, how much do you, how many times do you reprogram your flash um, drive, not much. So the, the reliability or endurance requirements for memory applications are much more relaxed. So mechanical devices could be used for non-volatile memory applications first. 
before they're used for logic because of reliability endurance uh, concerns. Great. Do we have any other questions? Any last questions? Okay. Let's uh, join me for one more last round of applause. For Thank you. Okay.